Amen. So Joshua chapter 1. So of course, um, before we went uh, to the book of Galatians, we were in Judges. So maybe we'll just go through the Bible backwards until we get to the beginning. But Joshua chapter 1. So the book of Joshua begins right at the end of the, the, the wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. In Joshua chapter 1, we see that Moses um, has just died and they've, they're about to enter into the Promised Land. They're about to cross over the Jordan River. And just imagine, you know, they've been wandering in the wilderness as, as a punishment uh, for not having faith in God. We'll get into that a little bit um, in the sermon here. But um, basically, they've been, they've been anticipating this moment for nearly four decades. And here they are, and they're about ready to go into this land, and they're going into this land to possess it as God has been promising them for years and years and years. Not only are they going into the land to possess it, but they're going to have to fight for it, number one. And number two, they're going in with a brand new, with a brand new leader. Moses is not in charge anymore. Moses has died. And we have this man, Joshua, here in Joshua chapter 1 that is taking over for Moses. So in Joshua chapter 1, we see three conversations, really, and that's what I want to talk about this evening. We see three conversations. We see, first see God talking to Joshua, then we see Joshua talking to the people, and then we see the people responding back to Joshua. So I want to focus on those three conversations this evening, and first I want to talk about Joshua the man. Who is Joshua? Let's look at um, Joshua chapter 1 and verse number 1, and let's focus on, first of all, you know, as we step through the first couple verses here, who is this guy? Who is this man that is going to be taking them on this journey um, into the promised land? Look at verse number one, the Bible says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all his people unto the land, which I do give them, even to the children, of Israel. So it's interesting. I just want to read for you. You don't necessarily have to turn there, but in Jude, Moses is dead. But one interesting thing about Moses' death is, is God took his body. And in Jude um, chapter 9, or Jude verse number 9, the Bible says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. So God took, I mean, Moses was so loved by God in such in a special place that God took his body and no one, know, you know, no one knows where Moses was buried because the Bible says that God uh, took his body. Anyway, just an interesting note there. But the Bible says here that, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, and he says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan thou and all the people unto the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel. Now it's time to pass over um, the Lord says. They've been wandering for 40 years. Turn to Exodus chapter 17, and let's just look at who Joshua was. The first mention of Joshua in the Bible is Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17. Now, this is a very famous story if you've read the Bible. If, uh, you know, if you've read the Bible or you've listened to a lot of sermons on the Exodus, this is a very famous uh, sermon or story that a lot of pastors do sermons on. You'll hear a lot of sermons on how, you know, Moses, he, as this battle was raging, Moses, when his hands were up, I don't want to give away the story, we'll read a few verses here, but basically you'll, you'll hear a lot of sermons on how, you know, Aaron and Hur held up Moses' hands, because as his hands were raised up, they would win the battle, and when his hands got tired, you know, and he put them down, they would lose the battle. So Aaron and Hur, they helped Moses hold up his hands. Let's read uh, verse number 8 in Exodus chapter 17. The Bible says, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel and Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So they weren't in the battle. They went to the top of the hill to watch over the battle. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put, uh, put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, one on one on one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. 
in verse number 13, and Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So I, I mean, I've heard a lot of sermons about this story. And, you know, the application is generally a good one, first of all. The application is generally that, you know what, leadership sometimes needs help. Leadership sometimes needs support. You know, Moses, his hands got tired. He couldn't do it by himself. So here he had this support staff that would help him hold up his, his hands. But here's one thing that we need to notice here. As these three men stood on the hill, and Moses raised his hands, and of course, God gave them the victory, but who was down in the, in the, in the battlefield, in the valley, fighting the battle? It was this man, Joshua. It was this man, Joshua. He was a warrior already at this point, the Bible says. Turn to Exodus chapter 32. And he was a servant. He was not only a warrior who would go down, and I mean, he was literally doing the fighting here in this story in, jo in uh, Exodus chapter 17. In Exodus chapter 32, we see that he's a servant. He's a servant to Moses. When Moses was up on the mountain receiving the law from the Lord, the Bible says in verse 15, it says, And Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand, and the tables were written on both their sides, on the one side, and on the other they were written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there, was, there is a noise of war in the camp. So look, when Moses went up the mountain and the people rebelled and, you know, worshipped, you know, the whole golden calf and said, look, Joshua was with Moses. He was with Moses going up the mountain, at least part the way, anyway. At least he went up to help Moses, and then Moses went up to meet with God. But the point is, he was Moses' right-hand man. Turn to Numbers chapter 13. Moses, uh, Joshua was also, and, and uh, Brother Trevor brought this up, that was a good segue into this, um, you know, into this Bible study, by the way, Brother Trevor, thank you um, for Sunday night. Uh, Numbers chapter 13, we see that um, Joshua was one of, the, one of the 12 spies that went to spy out the land. Look at Numbers 13 and verse number 6. The Bible says, And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jeph Jephunneh, were of them that searched the land, and they rent, their, they rent their clothes. So this is when they all came back, the twelve spies, and everyone said, oh, they're so big, and they're, they're all these people, we could never win these battles, except for Joshua and, Ca and Caleb. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel ye not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. I mean, Joshua and Caleb were the only ones that had any faith. They were the only ones that came back and said, who cares how big they are? Who cares what's going on? He's like, their defense is departed from them. He's like, if, you know, it's like God's going to be with us. Hello? You know, they had just complete faith. In the Lord. Look at verse number 30. Doubtless ye shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jeph Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. So, of course, this is God saying, you know, that because of, you know, the fact that you have, you know, had no faith in me except these two men, you're not, you're going to have to wander. He says, but your little ones which ye, ye said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and ye shall know the land which ye despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness. And your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, and bear your whoredoms until the carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. So, of course, that's the reason for the wandering for forty or nearly forty years that they wandered after this point in the wilderness. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 3. So, not only was Joshua uh, a chosen, he was a warrior, he was a chosen servant. Um, to Moses. He was a servant to, no, to Moses, but look, he was actually chosen by God to lead the people after Moses died. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 3 
and look at verse number 25. In Deuteronomy chapter 3 and verse number 25, we see Moses asking God once again if he could be able to go into the promised land. Moses, of course, was not allowed to go into the promised land you know, because of a mistake he made um, early on. But the Bible says here that Moses asks again to God, and God says no, and he tells him something here. Look at verse 25. He says, I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, Moses says that goodly mountain in Lebanon. But the Lord was wroth with me for your sakes who would not hear me. And the Lord said unto me, Let it suffice thee, speak no more unto me of this matter. The Lord said, Don't ask again. Like, my decision is my decision. He says, Get thee up into the top of Pisgah, and lift up thine eyes westward, and northward, and southward, and east eastward, and behold it with thine eyes, for thou shalt not go over this Jordan. But... Charge Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him, for he shall go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which thou shalt see. So God said to Moses, Joshua will lead them in. So Joshua, all that to say this, folks, Joshua was no spring chicken at this point in Joshua chapter 1. Joshua, he was a seasoned warrior. He had served Moses the entire time that they were in the wilderness. Forty years. He knew how to lead the people, and they respected him. Okay, go back to Joshua chapter 1. So God is still speaking to Joshua here. We're still in the first conversation of Joshua chapter 1. Look at verse number 3. God is still speaking to Joshua. And the Bible says, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, and the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage. I want you to notice how many times God says this in this chapter, first of all. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance of the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. So look, I mean, first of all, in verse number 5, and I don't want to just launch off on this, you know, for the rest of the sermon, but in verse number 5, God is basically saying to him, I mean, it, it's pretty direct, I will not fail thee or forsake thee. God is saying to Joshua directly, I will not fail you. And then he also says, you know, be strong and of good courage. So, I mean, God's kind of given some, some, you know, double dose there. Because, I mean, really, if God tells you, look, I will be behind you no matter what, you, I mean, you really don't necessarily even need that much courage, in my opinion. <laughs> I mean, if God, the most powerful being in the entire universe that created us all, says that to you, you know, you should pretty much just take it as faith, face value. But he says, be strong and of good courage. For unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Verse number seven. Only be, be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee, turn not from the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper wherever, wherever thou goest. Now, this is interesting. Because, well, let me just read verse number 8, and then we'll stop. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but shall meditate there, you shall meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So it's interesting that in verse number 6 he says, be strong and of good courage. He says in verse number 5, he says, I will, I will never, he's like, I will never fail you. And then he says, be strong and of good courage. But then in verse number 7, he says, be strong and of good courage. In verse number 8, he says, you know, he's saying, be strong and of good courage in verse number 7. But he's talking about following the law, not fighting. He's talking about that it's going to take strength and courage. What God is saying here is he's saying, he's like, because look, this is how it works with nations, folks. This is how it works with nations. He's saying, don't go into this dangerous situation and then forget the law, and then forget God. And he's like, oh, by the way, in order to, to obey God and to follow the law and to speak the law, he's like, not only are you to, to just obey the law, you're supposed to speak the law. 
Meaning, you're supposed to go and tell people the law. You're supposed to teach people. Let me just break this down for you. You're supposed to learn the Bible, and you're supposed to teach people the Bible, is what, is what he's saying here. You teach people the Word of God. Learn it and teach it. He's saying, in that, and he's like, that's going to take courage. Just that. Learning, following, and teaching the law will take courage, is what God is telling people. Uh, Joshua here. And then he says, for then, here's that if, if then statement again. For then I will make thy way prosperous. Look, this is how it works for nations. It's very simple. Why can't anyone in the history of the world get this correctly? A nation, whatever you are, forsake the Lord, suffer. Obey the Lord, prosper. I mean, that's not complicated. Remember, nations are judged on this earth. I mean, that, that's what we see in the entire Old Testament. You know, and they're, they're commanded to not only obey the law, but to speak the law in verse number 8. So don't miss that. It is, you know, God is essentially warning them here. He's saying, don't go into this dangerous situation and forget about me. That's what he's telling them. Look at verse number 9. He says, have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be, not, be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Now is the second conversation. God just tells him, he's like, here's what you need to do. He's like, just be, he's like, I'm with you wherever you go. He's like, be strong, be courageous. He says it, you know, three times here. He's saying, don't forget about me though. Don't forget, you know, to obey God. Don't go into this situation where all your enemies are on every side and forget about the Lord. And don't you do that either in your life. But now Joshua responds. Look at verse number 10. And he speaks, he speaks right away to the people. In verse number 10, Joshua says, Joshua, the Bible says, Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, These are the leaders of the people. Pass through the host and command the people, saying, Prepare you victuals. That means... Get your things together. Get ready. For within three days you shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. And to the Reubenites and the Gadites and to the half-tribe of Manasseh spake Joshua, saying, turn to Numbers chapter 32. So now, now he says this to the officers of the people. Now he speaks, speaks specifically to these three tribes. You say, why is that? Say, why is that? But turn to Numbers chapter 32. Let's just do a refresher on the history of why he's speaking specifically to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe tribe of Manasseh. Look at Numbers 32 and verse number 2. Now this is before, like I said, this is before they had passed over the Jordan. Okay, so they're on the, they're on the east side of the Jordan, and three tribes, three tribes decided that, hey, you know what? This land's pretty good right here. You know, this land's pretty good. In Numbers chapter 32, look at verse number 2. The children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spake to Moses. We're going back in the past now. And to Eleazar, Eleazar the priest, and to the princes of the congregation, saying, Adaroth and Dixon and Jazer and Namrah and Heshbon and Elele and Shebam and Nebo and beyond, even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel, is a land for cattle, and thy servants have cattle. Wherefore, said they, if we have found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for a possession, and bring us not over the Jordan. So they're saying, they're saying to Moses, they're saying, you know what, Moses? They're like, we have cattle. This is like good grazing land. You know, this is good for us. It's like, we, you know what, can, can we just stay here? Can we just stay here and not go over the Jordan? They say to Moses, what's the first thing that Moses said, says to them. And Moses said unto the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war? And shall ye sit here? So right away Moses... Now there's a, there's a great lesson here. There is a great lesson. I mean, how evil it was. Uh, you know, Moses saw right away, he said, he said how, you know, that it would be a wicked thing if they were doing this to get out of having to fight for the land that the Lord had given them. And Moses said, you want to just, 
Your, your, your brothers? You want your brothers to go to war and you guys just sit here and just take this land right here? He's like, you know, that's, that, that's messed up is what Moses is, is, you know, he's asking what their motives are. But look, this, and this, it's interesting because this is a lesson that, this is a lesson that we all should, should learn in our lives. Look, and it's something, look, you need to teach your children this too. Because I'm telling you, it's not something that comes natural. I'm gonna, I didn't ask Brother Francisco for permission to tell this story, but I'm going to tell it anyway, Brother. I'm sorry. I, I went fishing with Brother Francisco on Saturday. Let me give you an example of this. And we went fishing. We caught all kinds of fish because I'm a great fisherman. I don't know what to tell you. No, I'm just kidding. But we caught a ton of fish, okay? And you know what's really fun is catching fish. You know what's not fun is like, cleaning up and cleaning the fish and staying up all night cutting up fish and cleaning up the mess and and putting everything away and all this kind of you know that's not that much fun and brother Francisco he didn't even drive with us so I drove back to my house and he's sitting in front of my house must have been waiting there for half an hour 40 minutes or whatever since we're a lot slower than, than he was and look I'm just telling you this is something I always notice and I even asked him I even asked him you know Here's the thing, whenever you have people working, whenever you have people doing things and working, you should not be comfortable not working. You should never be comfortable just sitting there while other people are working. This is what Moses is talking about here on a much bigger scale. But Brother Francisco, I, I mean, we were sitting there, we were cleaning fish, it was dark. He's tired, I'm tired, we're cleaning, and he's just like, he's just going, he's putting stuff away, he's doing, you know, and I'm just like, you know what, I, I just finally, I just asked him, I said, you know what, I was like, who taught you this? I was like, why are you doing this? And, and, and you know, he's just like, no, well, you know, it's just, you know, I'm going to help. And I was like, no, but no, and, I, and what I meant was, I knew somebody taught him that, because it doesn't come natural. It doesn't come natural. We have to teach our kids this. How do I know that somebody taught, taught Brother Francisco that? Because I gotta teach my kids that. Because when I'm out working on something with my kids and I'm like, hey, hand me this, or they're holding, doing that, that one job, the first job your kid should ever have is holding the flashlight for their dad. You hold the flashlight. And then they give you the part or whatever, and then naturally, here's what naturally kids do. You're working on something, they've given you the part, and you're working on something, you don't need them for seven or eight minutes, and you turn around and give me that other wrench, and they're gone. And they're gone. Where'd they go? Well, they're, you know, they're digging a hole, or they're in the house. And I go in the house, and I'm upset. And this is where my wife will be like, oh, you're too hard on the kids. But look, this needs to be taught. And I'm not even joking a little bit. So I go in the house, and I grab them, the, the kids, or the, the, I, I grab, you know, one of, you know, the boys or whatever. I don't want to call them out by name. And I'm like, hey, did I say we were done working? No. Was your dad still working? Yes. So you stay there until the job's done. Look, that, that kind of thing is taught. And if you don't teach it, it won't happen. If you don't teach it, you will end up with an adult who will be completely comfortable with 10 people working and just sitting there chatting or doing whatever. Because it's not taught. And I finally pressed Brother Francisco. I said, who? Who is it? Who taught you? Who taught you this? And he said, my grandpa. He said, my grandpa taught me this. He said, my grandpa taught me that you work until the work is done. And if somebody else is working, you, you find something to do. Or you ask what else needs to be done. Or, you know, I mean, look, it, it, it's taught. It's, it's a good lesson here. You gotta teach your kids this because it's not gonna come natural. So Moses, this is what he thought they were doing. He's like, you wanna sit here? You wanna sit here while everybody else goes and fights? You wanna sit here while everybody else works? It's like, I don't think so. I don't think so. But look what actually happened. Turn back, look it down at verse number 16. Look down at verse number 16. Look, I'm telling you, it should literally make you uncomfortable. It should literally make you uncomfortable to be around a bunch of people that are working if you're not working. You should just be immediately getting up going, ah, what should I do? You should be doing something. 
But you see, it, you see it all the time. You see it all the time because it's taught. It's taught. It doesn't come natural. But look at the Gads and the, the Reubenites and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Look what they said in verse number 16. He said, they came near to him and said, we will build sheepfolds here for our cattle and cities for our little ones. No, we'll build, we'll build uh, barns and we'll build uh, places for our families, but we ourselves will go ready armed before the children of Israel until we have brought them into their place and our little ones shall dwell in the fenced cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return unto our houses until the children of Israel have inherited every man his inheritance. They said, we will go and we will fight for land that isn't even ours. That's not our motive. So they had, they had good motives. They just wanted that particular land because they were, they were husbandmen. They had cattle. Their motives were pure in this case. Go back to Joshua chapter 1. But it's interesting that Moses, right away, he just jumped up. He's like, oh, you're not these type of people, are you? But they said, no, we're not. No, we're not. So remember, we ha that has to be taught, though. That has to be taught. Look at Joshua chapter 1 and verse number 13. Look what the Bible says. Remember, now this is Joshua speaking to the people. Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, now he's speaking the same story that I just told you, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God hath given you rest. He's reminding them, and hath given you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan. But ye shall pass before your brethren armed, all the mighty men of valor, and help them. Until the Lord hath given your brethren rest, as he hath given you, and they have also possessed the land which the Lord your God hath given them, then ye shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses the Lord's servant gave you on this side of the Jordan toward the sun rising. So Moses gave him permission to do this, and I preached a whole sermon on this, but you know, typically, like when God has a plan, you probably just shouldn't veer from it. I mean, they had pure motives on this, but it wasn't, notice how it was Moses' land that he gave him. It wasn't God giving him the land. God gave him the land on the other side. All right, and we saw, and I preached a whole sermon on, you know, the negative effects that happened to these tribes because of the fact that they stayed on the east side of the Jordan. It's not the point here, but just to mention that, okay? Now, here's the third conversation, verse number 16. Now, keep in mind, now the people respond, okay? So we have Moses, or Moses, we have Joshua talking to the people. We have, um, I'm sorry, we have Joshua, God talking to Joshua, Joshua talking to the people. Now the people respond to Joshua. Now keep in mind, folks, they're not going to Disneyland here. Okay, don't go to Disneyland. All right, they're not going to an amusement park here. Okay, they're going to war. They're going to war. They're going into a dangerous situation where they're going to go and they're going to take land from people that don't want to give it to them. Okay, look at verse 16. And they answered Joshua. The people said this. And they said, man, I don't know. I don't know if, uh, where's Moses, man? Is Moses on board with this? If Moses was here, no, that's not what they said. Look what they said. And they answered Joshua saying, all that thou commanded us, we will do. And whithersoever thou send us, we will go. According as we hearkened unto Moses in all things, so we will hearken unto thee. Only the God of thy God be with thee as he was with Moses. Whosoever he be that do, doth rebel against thy commandment and not hearken unto the words and all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. So they just give their full-fledged support to Joshua here. They said, we'll follow you just like we followed Moses. So what's the applications here? First of all, just a side note, Joshua you know, is a bit of a picture of Christ here. You know, he's leading the people into the promised land as Christ, you know, leads us by our eternal salvation into um, heaven, right? But what's the application here? Turn to Psalm chapter 75. Let me just give you a couple um, application points to Joshua chapter 1. So we see Joshua the man. We see the response of the people to him. Look, that is an incredible response from those people. Look at Psalm chapter 75. The first point I want to make here is this. Look, God, God was going to give them this land. God said, I will not fail you. I'm giving you this land. But he did ordain a human leader here. He did ordain a man to lead them. And the first point I want to make is that God does ordain human leadership for us in this world. Look at Psalm 75 and verse 5. Psalm 75 and verse number 5. Look what the Bible says. It says, 
Lift up not your horn on high, speak not with a stiff neck. For a promotion come neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south, but God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. Look, God sets up and puts down leaders. Joshua was this leader in the making for decades that God was setting up for this purpose. I mean, I'll read for you again Deuteronomy 3.28. But charge Joshua and encourage him, God said, and strengthen him, for he shall go over before this people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which God, with thou shalt see. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11. Go ahead and turn there. Look, God, God sets up. Look, God is here. We have the Word of God. You have the Bible in your hand right now. All right? You have the Bible. You have the Word of God. The Bible even, even says, the Word of God even says, you don't need a mediator. You don't need a mediator to just speak directly with Christ. You can go home right now and you can pray directly to Jesus Christ. You do not need me. You can pray directly to God, to Jesus himself, and just say, God, you know, Jesus, forgive me for what I did today. You do not need to come to me to, you know, to reach God. There is one mediator, in the man, and it is the man Christ Jesus. Right. And that is the mediator. Look, but God does give you human leadership on this earth. Look at Ephesians 4 and verse number 11. And the Bible says, and, and look, it tells us why he gives us those things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists. I mean, think of Brother Stuckey in, in the Philippines. Look, God gave those people an evangelist. God gave those, those people in those two churches. I mean, thank God. I mean, I bet you they're th saying thank God that we have an evangelist here that's here to, to lead us. And some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers, you say, but can't those people in the Philippines read the Bible themselves? Yes, they can. They can read the Bible themselves. They can pray themselves. But look at verse number 12. It's for the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. It's to sharpen them up. It's to lead them. Look, God sets up human leaders to perfect us, to make us a, a strong unit, to, to go out and, and to do the work of Christ, to be the ambassadors of Christ. Look, I mean, Brother Johannes said to me today, I'm, you know, he said, he's like, I can't even imagine going through last year without having a church. Amen. And I said, yeah, because you know what you'd do? You'd sit there, and I told him, I said, like, I'm working it right into the sermon right now, brother. I was like, this is a great conversation. This should be a sermon. Here it goes, right here. I told him, I was like, Cause you, can you imagine, we walk by this yard. Can you imagine you walk by this green grass, and everybody is telling you that the grass is red. Everybody's saying, that grass is red. And you don't have a single other... You're looking at that grass, and that grass is green. And you're like, what in the world? But every single person that you know is saying that that grass is red. And they say it every day, and they say it every week, and they say it every month for a year. This is what happened to people. Not us, though. Not us. Why? Why not us? Because we have a church. Because we have a church, and we're grounded in the Bible. That's why. Because we're not sitting there watching a stupid TV eight hours a day. We're saying the grass is red, the grass is red, the grass is red, the grass is red. We're sitting here and we're reading the Bible. And not only do we have that, but we have like, you know, 50 other people standing around us going, can you believe everybody thinks that that grass is red? It's clearly green. But if you're the only one, if you're the only one, you would start to be like, you know what? Maybe something's wrong with me. And you start to think, you know, I, I see that it's green, but it must be red. That's what happened to people. That's what happened to people. But we're here to edify each other, to strengthen each other, to sharpen each other. We know the grass is green. The Bible tells us what the Bible tells us, and we sit here and we encourage and we strengthen each other. And, I mean, that's how it works. Yeah, so I can't imagine it either, brother, if we wouldn't have had a church. But that's, that's the strength. Of it. So God ordains human leadership for us to have for the work of the ministry. And the ministry is important. It's important for people out there. It's important for us. So we can gather together and strengthen each other. The second point I want to make about Joshua is this. 
in order to lead, you first, listen to this, in order to lead, you first need to learn how to serve. This is a huge miss for many leaders today. Uh, maybe, maybe most of them today. Over a, turn back to Exodus chapter 33. Over a 40 year period serving Moses. Let me just give you one more example of this. As if I didn't give you enough examples. Moses would go to the tabernacle in the wilderness to speak to God. Moses would go to the tabernacle to speak to God. But look at Exodus chapter 33 and verse number 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp. So Moses would go to the tabernacle and he would speak to God, and then he would go back to his, ho his house or his tent or whatever. He would not stay at the tabernacle. But his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Joshua stayed. Joshua stayed. To, to watch over the tabernacle. Look, it'd be like someone watching over this place living here. It'd be like a, a certain, you know, we almost need it, by the way. We almost need it, brother. I'm going to start calling brother Frank Joshua. We're running two-hour shifts here to keep these vagrants off the, off the church property. And brother Frank's been helping me out. Thank you, brother Frank, for that. But look, the point is, Joshua... Was, was serving no matter what it took. No matter what it took. To be a good leader, you must first be a good follower. Because look, leadership is service. That's what it is. It'll not only keep you humble as a leader, but here's the thing. Here's the thing, and I really want to point this out, and I want to end the sermon on this note. It'll give you credibility. There's a reason, there's a reason that the people, there's a reason that I focus on three conversations here. The conversation from God to Joshua, the, the conversation from Joshua to the people, and then the response of the people to Joshua. It's super important that you recognize that. Imagine if Joshua's life was, you know, of serving Moses. Imagine if the 40 years of serving Moses was living this plush life. I'm in charge. I'm number two around here. Better do what I say. Living this plush life, just, you know, telling people what to do because he was Moses' right hand. Don't you know who I am? You better do what I say. Imagine if this was his life. And then Moses dies and he took over. It'd be a disaster. It'd be a complete disaster. Instead, instead, you know what people saw? People saw a loyal servant to Moses. They saw... Somebody who, they saw somebody who when there needed to be fighting done, they, they did the fighting. They picked up the sword and they fought. They saw somebody who did the heavy lifting, who did the, you know, he, they did the, he did the hardest things. I mean, fighting, leading battles down in the battle, that's the hardest thing. So turn to Proverbs chapter 22. Look, you must have credibility to lead, or it will not work. Joshua had a reputation by the time we get to Joshua chapter 1. People knew his character and they knew his strength. You get to the point, I mean, he got to the point where he could just command people, I mean, he could just command people to just go into the worst situation where they might die, and they would say, and all that thou commanded us to do and whithersoever thou send us, we will go. I mean, that's impressive. That, I mean, you, that came from his, his credibility and his reputation. That's where that came from. And look, you can't just, every leader wants that. But you can't just, you know, you can't just command it just like that. It took Joshua 40 years to get that, to get to that place. Look at Proverbs chapter 22. And look at verse number 1. The Bible says a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver or gold. So many people miss this. So many people miss this. Look, look, folks, your salvation is free. Look, you are saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you are saved, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit, nothing can change that. God can never lie. He will never take it away from you. It had nothing to do with you. It had nothing to do with you to get it. It has nothing to do with you to keep it. Otherwise, I mean, what's the difference? If I have to work to get it, it's the same as having to work to keep it. There's no difference. But the point is this. 
The point is that your salvation is free, but respect is earned. Respect is earned. And look, most people, most people will never get it, and they will never understand why they don't have it. And the reason is, is because it takes a lifetime of living consistently. It takes, I mean, of, of fighting battles, of showing, of showing courage, of showing loyalty, of serving. It takes a lifetime of service. You're like, that sounds hard. It is hard. It is hard. You should ask yourself, you know, do I have, do I have credibility? Do I have credibility? Am I building credibility with people? What does my life look like over the last few years? You know, are you do, am, I, am I doing the things that I say? You know, one thing about the satellite ministry, I will say this. Another thing we were talking about today. You know, Brother Johannes, like the, the, last, the last two years have gone really fast. That's true. That's true. They have gone very fast. But you know what? It did not come easy. These last two years or almost two years have gone like that. But it did not come easy. And you know what? I'm glad. I'm glad that it didn't come easy. Because if it was just some easy thing that just everybody could do, look, these 40 years of Joshua serving, they didn't come easy. But it was necessary. It was necessary for him to have that credibility with these people in this time. Because they're going at a very difficult time right now. And who knows where we're going. But we're going to be doing the things that we're supposed to do, and, you know, things might get difficult. I mean, some people would, may say last year was difficult. But we're going to go. So we have to have, you know, I have to have this credibility. Look, here's the thing. People don't realize this, but you have a reputation, whether you like it or not. Whether you like it or not, you have a reputation. You're like, I don't want a reputation. You have one, sorry. You have a reputation. Look at Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 11. Everyone has one. Everyone has one. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 11, the Bible says this. It says, even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure or whether it be right. This doesn't say a child is known by his doings. It says, it, says, it means everybody is known by what they do. Even a child. You are known by what you do. That is what your reputation is. You know, I mean... You're like, man, my wife and children, they just have to obey me. That's true. That's what the Bible says. But it's much better to lead in situations where people look at you and they say, you know what, we'll follow you wherever you go. Because you have that credibility. And you have that respect and you have that reputation. But look, it's just, it just doesn't come easy. It doesn't come fast. It's hard. Joshua built it over, you know, four decades it's crazy to even think about that, that he served for so long in every single capacity that, you know, that Moses needed him to serve. Whether it be camping out and guarding the tabernacle or actually fighting a war. He was there to serve and he was consistent. And look, that's what it takes, folks. That's what it takes to gain credibility. You're like, you know what, I don't have credibility. It, maybe it's because your, your life is showing inconsistency instead of consistency. You know, it, you have to think about this. It takes time because, look, that's what it takes to get people to say, we will follow you wherever you go. Joshua is a great example of what a leader needs to be and how a credible leader is developed. Okay, Joshua chapter 1. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.